Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, MLATS, Machine Learning and Data Science Conference at Microsoft. This talk is another Cosmos DB talk, but we are going to talk about graph databases and different graph queries you can use. My name is Luis Bosquez, and I, I am a product manager, program manager inside of Cosmos DB, and I work specifically on the graph database side. So you can reach me at lbsq at microsoft.com. My email is not here, but you can probably find it in the schedule. Um, and uh, Twitter, if you know Cosmos DB, we, are, we love Twitter. And you know, it's really like a differentiating factor amongst PMs. Like we, we brag about how many Twitter followers we have. So I'm just putting it out there just in case you guys you know, feel like following it. Also, a lot of the demos in this and other talks that I give are on GitHub. So if you follow my GitHub, you'll find that as well. I don't think other speakers had a speaker bio, so I'm going to skip it. And Today we'll talk about well, what we call the Gremlin API. Gremlin is the language uh, based on the Apache Tinkerbob specification, which is a standard for graph databases. Uh, I think the main interest for this audience, which is mostly data science and machine learning, is how to model problems using graph databases, which is one of the, I guess, biggest benefits of graph databases. Uh, we'll talk about a few of the queries that you can run against a graph database, as well as why you would use it as opposed to a relational database management system. Um, and what kind of data applies for a graph database? So, how many people here are familiar with Cosmos DB already? I mean, I guess the previous talk did actually give a lot of information about it, so uh, I don't think I need to talk more about it, but I will do it anyway. So, this is Cosmos DB, and this is just the introductory slide. Uh, Gremlin API, or the Graph Database API, is just one of the interfaces you can use to talk to it. How to use a, a, an API in Cosmos DB? Well, you the, the logic behind it is that you have your existing application that is built against either MongoDB, Cassandra, Gremlin, etc. cetera. Uh, and the idea is that you don't have to change your, your libraries, you don't have to change your application platform. You just change your connection string and migrate your data. And theoretically, and assuming that we support the same amount of uh, feature, the same feature surface area, you would be able to use your application against Cosmos DB and take advantage of all the benefits, including global distribution, elastic scale out, blah, blah. So, Gremlin API is one of those cases, and I think the best way to exemplify it and to show uh, the capabilities in it is by jumping directly into a demo. So how many people here are familiar with the problem of the six degrees of Kevin Bacon? Okay, so not all of you, okay. So the idea behind this is that any two actors or actresses in Hollywood are connected up to six degrees of separation, which is also a th theory for um, highly connected world, any two humans can have up to six degrees of connections between them. And a sample set for this uh, we obtained from IMDB. Uh, so this is an existing demo you can actually run yourself. It has all the logic to import the data from IMDB and uh, visualize it and then run queries against it using Cosmos DB. Uh, this is the link I worked with uh, one of the uh, cloud solution architects called Chris Joachim. Credit where it's due. Great job, Chris. And this is uh, the demo, basically. So there's six degrees of separation, up to six degrees of separation between two actors. Uh, we imported all that data and formed a graph in Cosmos DB. Uh, the source of the data is IMDB, so no proprietary data there. Uh, and we defined two types of vertices and two types of edges. So vertices and edges, I should probably start there, are uh, the two graph objects you can use to, uh, exemplify, to create an example or a model of a real world data problem. Just think of it as two objects and connections between objects. Uh, the two objects we have are people, basically, uh, actors and actresses in a movie, movies, and there's relationships between a, an actor or actress and a movie and actors or actresses be between each other. So a very simple representation of this graph would look the following way. Actor or actress A knows uh, person B in a doubly linked uh, structure, and they both are in movie A, whatever movie that is. So let's go and dive into it. The Azure portal does, does that all the time. So once you create a Cosmos DB account, you will have access to this tool that is called the Data Explorer. A Data Explorer is a lightweight utility you can use to visualize uh, any sort of data that is in Cosmos DB, and we have a special flavor of it for graph databases. So a graph database will include a D3-based seri um, serialization, visualization, which 
allows you to see every one of the objects in the graph as well as interact with them just to like select which objects are tied to each other. And for example, here you can see uh, in this example, Gene Hackman has acted in a movie with Sean Jong Young, Kevin Costner, and Will Payton. So let's get started with uh, querying this data set. I have a few uh, example queries. For example, give me, can someone in the audience give me the name of an A-list actor we can uh, explore the data set for? Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. All right. Good choice. Let's see. So the query, uh, and this query language is called the Gremlin query language. Uh, the query would look like the following way. Let me actually explain it a little, a little deeper. So g.v will select the superset of all vertices of, or, or all objects. Then we'll filter that based on uh, a name, that one of the name properties in the objects. So the name here is Tom Cruise. And this will select this specific vertex. So you'll see uh, the visualization is not directly related to the query itself, but it'll show additional uh, adjacent vertices. So for example, here you can see that the ID is um, this randomly generated number. Uh, this is a person, and it's Tom Cruise. Uh, Cosmos DB, the way it deals with scale in data is by selecting a partitioning key. So that key will be hashed, and that's how the partitioning scheme is going to be automatically uh, created. Just some implementation details. So let's learn more about Tom Cruise. What movies has Tom Cruise been in? Now, this is also a sample of the IMDB data set. So it may not show all of the movies. In fact, it only shows one of them, which is A Few Good Men. Now, let's try a different query. This theorem is known as, there, there was going to be a suggestion of what query. It's fine. No, this, this, I just wanted to show this one other query. Um, this theorem is based on the fact that Kevin Bacon is actually in a lot of movies. And um, it's named after him because it's, the, the idea is that he is connected to, he's either the most connected actor or at least one of the most connected actors out there. So let's see how many connections uh, he actually has. Uh, now, as a reminder, this is a, first of all, a sample of the data set, and second of all, uh, all the actors or actresses that have been in the same movie as Kevin Bacon. So this query result, uh, resulted in 134 people uh, Kevin Bacon has acted with. What about uh, the path itself, which is the problem statement for this, um, for, for this uh, solution? So what this query does is uh, it selects the superset of all vertices, then filters them based on uh, this criteria, which is, in this case, get someone with the name of John Goodman. Then it starts a loop which explores on the out direction from that query uh, until it, it finds someone with the name Keanu Reeves. Let's actually change it to some other actor just to... So this query will instantiate a loop and actually Yes, so in this case, it showed the following results. So in order to get from John Goodman to uh, Tara Reid, you have to go through Tom Hanks, John Hurd, and then reach Tara Reid. Let's try this other one. So this other query is a very similar one, but in this case, we start from two vertices, and then we try to see what movie they have in common. So the two vertices that I chose completely arbitrarily are Tara Reid and John Hurd. And of course, this data set will find that the movie they're in together is Sharknado. I may or may not have four Sharknado into this. <laughs> That's why they, those are the actors that we, that we selected. And so one last query I wanted to show with this data set is the following. So and this might be like groundbreaking. So how, how do we know that Kevin Bacon is one of the most connected actors? Well, we select and count all of the connections that they have to other actors or actresses. But this query will actually aggregate every single one of the actors in the data set, and it will count every single one of the connections they have just to see if it is true that Kevin Bacon is actually the most connected actor in, in Hollywood. So that, just like that, the query just returned all of the results. And we see that Kevin Bacon has 134 connections, but there's Tom Hanks and Keanu Reeves above him with additional connections to them. So I guess it actually doesn't sound as good to say six degrees of Reeves or Hanks. It's just, it's just catchier to say six degrees of Bacon. 
But this is just an example of how you can leverage a graph database to see all these uh, complex relationships. Uh, and it's most applicable for data sets that are highly interconnected and then there's value from actually uh, browsing those connections between them. Uh, the Graph Explorer can also show you these visualizations and you can customize them by using some of the properties in style. So for example, you can change uh, the color or the names that are shown and printed on the, um, on the visualization side, as well as you can show all the sources, all the neighbors and the vertices, uh, all the neighbors that are connected to the vertices themselves. Uh, it also has a cool animation that will show you uh, under, and that, that will allow you to visually explore the graph data set and just get all the, um, you know, pretty, pretty useful for uh, lightweight visualization and lightweight browsing of this graph data set. And it'll get you all the adjacent and neighboring uh, objects around it. So that's the demo. And um, let's talk about what just happened here and how we actually created this. Um, Again, this demo you can find on uh, GitHub. Yeah, I, will, I will post the link and it'll be shared uh, with the presentation. I think they're shared after uh, the conference is over. Uh, but let's talk about exactly what a graph database is. So a, what's known as a Tinkerpop graph, Tinkerpop is an Apache-based standard for graph databases. And it defines all the way from uh, languages to frameworks that are implemented in that and just sets uh, all the appropriate uh, rules that, these, that this environment of, of frameworks uh, will need to implement. There's two objects that are defined basically in this graph um, database standard. One of them is a vertex, which, re which represents an object, and the other one is an edge, which represents a relationship. For example, this vertex uh, can have an ID, a label, which defin defines within its own uh, object type what type of object it represents. So in this case, it's a person, and, it, and every one of these objects can have an arbitrary list of key value properties. For example, uh, this has the property of age 25. In this case, uh, we also have an edge that represents a relationship between two vertices. And so for example, in this case, I used uh, the label works at, which would represent a relationship between the vertex uh, Luis and probably Microsoft. So Luis works at Microsoft. That is just one of the ways you can implement uh, this model to solve one of the real problems. So for instance, we have, um, we're gonna construct a graph uh, and you know this is what's known as a non-relational database, which means that uh, you don't define a schema or you don't define constraints to which the data have to um, comply with or to the data where, where the data have to fit. Uh, that this happens when you read the data. Uh, in other words, uh, you insert the data first, ask questions later. And here we have Kobe Bryant. Uh, we assign the label person to him uh, and just a few properties. Kobe Bryant is part of the Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, additional properties that could enrich this data set is which state it is, which is California. Uh, we define the vertex object as a team kind of uh, vertex object. Now, what's the best practice? And the idea of this exercise is to also define best practices in terms of uh, querying and in terms of data design so that, so that it eventually does not become a challenge to, uh, to obtain the data. Uh, one of the best practices is to actually separate data objects as units so for example, um, we have here Kobe Bryant has five NBA championships and within the properties we define what year they were, they were obtained in and the type of them being an award. All right, so that is another um, object you can, def you can connect with uh, this existing data set. But something historical happened, it happened in 2018. In February 2018, uh, Kobe Bryant won an Oscar. So it makes him the first um, athlete that has won both an NBA championship and an Oscar. And so you have a label of award, but a different kind of award. You have uh, properties of what category was obtained and when it was obtained. So what happens if we insert a uh, data point that is completely unrelated, say Tom Cruise? So Tom Cruise hasn't, hasn't won an Oscar, none he has won or is close to winning an NBA championship. So how do we collect this data set with the idea in mind that uh, you collect data first, ask questions later. Well, we find a way to relate this uh, data set, otherwise this is known as a dangling uh, vertex graph. Well, we can say that both of them are Hollywood celebrities and that's one of the ways we can connect this, this graph, um, this, this graph um, example, this graph scenario. Uh, so as you can see, and one thing that I forgot to include in this uh, graphic slash joke was that in the edges you can also store additional properties. So for example, uh, if 
one of the NBA championships has more weight than the other ones, depending on the uh, data space that we're trying to explore. This can be stored as a, as a numeric value in the edges, and it can be used later on uh, through uh, calculations around it. Like, for example, if, say, for some reason, the NBA championship of 2010 was the most important one, I don't know, I don't follow basketball, then uh, we, can add, we can store that in the edges and then use that in the queries as a comparison query or a filtering query. So now that, now that we know what a, what a graph, uh, how to model a problem with graph, let's look, about, let's look at when should I use a graph database. So, and this is, a compar this is going to start a comparison against relational uh, graph, re relational databases. Um, here are a few scenarios uh, that where a graph database usually per either performs better or provides a better programmability uh, as opposed to a relational database. If you have hierarchically, hierarchically stru structured relational data, say uh, multiple parent hierarchies on the same rows, uh, graph databases are usually easier to deal with. Uh, Self-referencing tables in relational databases, say groups or groups, we're going to walk through an example and this will be much clearer, uh, is usually better modeled in a graph database. Overly complicated designs, so for example, if 90% if of your queries are excessive amounts of joins, it means that you may be exploring, you may be getting more value out of the relationships within your data than the data stored in the tables themselves. And just flexibility in data modeling, just like the way we inserted Tom Cruise into a space where you have nothing to do, uh, that can also be a, um, an advantage uh, when modeling a real, real world uh, scenario. So let's walk through an example on how we could solve a problem with a graph as opposed to with a relational database. So I call this, is your data naturally a graph? And, it's in the follow and, and it looks like the following way. So think about an HR uh, data set, right? And so you have, say, a sales group and an engineering group. And you have Luis, Andrew are, are members of the sales group, and Rima is a member of the engineering group. The same way you would represent this in a relational database would be the following. You have three employees, and you, you store uh, the group as a property of each one of the rows of employees. Pretty simple. But let's try to complicate this a little more. Um, say this, this organization has frequent reorgs, like some other organization. I'm not going to say which one. What, about, what if you can belong to different groups? Well, in the case of a graph data, uh, in the case of, the, of a graph database, you can just say, OK, well, just add an additional relationship represented as a document uh, to the other group. So for example, in this case, Andrew is both a salesperson and an engineer. In a relational table, you'd have to create a table that stores the relationships, so uh, just one level of normalization. And again, there could be many uh, other solutions. I just try to, try to go f uh, with the, I guess, one that was the simplest and that made the most sense uh, according to our relational databases uh, standards. So you create a table of employees and a table of groups and then just a relationship between tables, uh, between these tables. Pretty standard. But how about complicating it a little more? What about nested groups? So what if there's groups of groups? For example, these are all, this is a sales group in Azure and an engineering group in Azure, right? Well, this, as, this is easy in a graph database because you just define a new object and two relationships to the other objects. The semantic uh, value that you get out of it, you will get it as you query the database. But in a relational space, you'd have to define a table that contains groups of groups. So if you wanted to get a query that gets, well, like, get me everyone in Azure, you'd have to first retrieve the supergroup and which groups are under the supergroup, then join that to the relationship between groups and employees, and then join that to the employees um, group. And if you need the names, you'd have to get it from the, names, uh, from the group ID and name uh, table. So in total, this will represent a change of three documents in the graph side, or another table, six rows, and two new columns in the relational side. Uh, can we complicate this a little more? Yes, we can. What about hierarchies? So assume that this is good enough, but then uh, an application requirement is to say, well, who's managing who? Um, so in this case, uh, Rima is the manager of both me and Andrew. So in the graph side, we just add two additional relationships uh, represented by two documents. But this is a little bit more complicated in the relational side. So you, uh, well, the, way, the way I solved it is by creating a foreign key, um, a, a table that relates employees to employees. Uh, we just have to know that the first foreign key is the manager of the other foreign keys. To say, just, just as a, um, 
It's just something that we define in the application logic. Am I, am I on time? Yes. Uh, and then uh, the rest of the mess. You, you get the idea. <laughs> so with this current structure, uh, how, how does adding a new person look like? Well, uh, in this case, you just add the new person to the structure on the graph side. You just create a new vertex, two objects that relate them to either the other employees or a group, which belongs to groups of groups. Uh, but in this case, you have to modify one, two, three tables in four different ways. And, you know, it is, there are solutions out there that don't necessarily make use of a graph database. Yes, it is something that is possible to be solved with a relational database, of course. Uh, it's just a matter of how easy it is, how performant can it be, and how extensible is this model, right? For example, if we add another supergroup like, you know, Microsoft, because maybe this graph will contain other companies, then maintaining all of this becomes a little bit of a nightmare. Um, and the last example is something that, um, if you have a Hispanic last name, uh, you've probably heard before, we have two last names, and so everywhere I go by Mr. Gonzalez, because that's my second last name, and that's, that's not me. So the way I solved it in, in the relational space, uh, I added an additional column, but here I just added an additional property. Uh, so I don't have to change the, the rest of the, of the entries in the um, employees table to have a null second last name just because I needed a second last name. So let's uh, test out how these models um, perform with a semi-complex query against each of them. So the query is the following. Get all the managers under the engineering group, which should be relatively easy. Uh, in, let's start with the relational side. So, I, um, I'm, I'm going to admit my knowledge on T-SQL is not like great. I only worked in SQL Server for two years. And you know, it, it, it's such a complex space. And uh, it's a Turing complete language. So you can actually write anything in T-SQL. It's just a matter of how many lines is that going to take. So what I did is the following. Select name from employee, because we need the names of all the managers on the, the engineering group. Then join exclusively as, a, as an inner join all the employees with their groups and all the groups with the groups of groups. And then what I did here is I select, select this thing to get all of the unique IDs of everyone who's the manager because I'm using the employee ID and not the employee report ID. And then um, get the group name of engineering. And that's going to return uh, the name of Rima. On the graph side, uh, I just get the superset of all of the vertices. Then uh, I select the one that is the engineering group then get the members, and then since we're representing the uh, hierarchical relationship as documents between, as relationships between each of the members, let me just get the ones that have the relationship of direct report, go in an inverse direction, and get the name. This is also going to return Rima, and not the new person. And so, yes, both can solve this problem, yes, but it, at some point, and especially during an experimentation phase or using a data set that you need to um, at least model yourself and extend towards unknown different requirements that come to your engineering department, uh, it's really a choice of simplicity and it's really a choice of how, how your data will fit into this model and how you can make sense of the model after you, um, at, once you start querying the data. So, I'm going to show now a few ways to visualize a graph database. And um, one of the ways we can visualize a graph database is by using Power BI. So Microsoft worked on this really cool force-directed graph um, uh, visualiz visualizer, uh, which is available uh, not by default, but you have to download it from one of the pages. Um, and it's very easy to use and very easy to install. Let me actually demo that right now. So this data set, did I open it here? OK. So this is where you can get the uh, Power BI uh, visualizer. It's called uh, Force Direct Graph. If you, if you just Google or Bing um, Power BI Force Direct Graph, it's going to lead you to this page. Uh, it uses D3 in, 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 the, um, in the Power BI uh, process. And it shows you this cool visualization that is also interactive and has some uh, physics animations around it. So visualizing is actually um, one of the big advantages of using a graph database, just because you can visualize paths, you can visualize uh, th different aspects. So this uh, visualizer can also show you, let me see where it is, yes. So you can filter this, um, this graph data, and for example, I, here I used uh, the thickness of the links 
to denote the count of relationships that each of the, each of the objects has. Um, this is not immediately obvious, but this is the model of an airport. So if you saw the uh, Azure Data Keynote at Build, uh, I demoed an airport model and how you can create a most optimal path between one point and the other using a graph database. Uh, this is the same data set. And so the ones that are the biggest objects and that are uh, centered, uh, represented by the orange and the blue uh, arrows, connected by the orange and the blue arrows, are terminals. And inside of the terminals, you have restaurants, gates, restaurants and gates uh, that, are re that represent uh, the inner uh, structure of LAX. So it's just an additional tool you can use to visualize and to try to um, obtain uh, conclusions and insights from data, which is the whole point of using a database. Sorry, I can't hear anything at all. <laughs> yes, that's the idea. It's a, connected to a graph database in Cosmos DB. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a um, documentation article that will show how to specifically use that connector, download it, install it, and connect it to the graph data set. Another option you can use is the Graph Explorer, which is an application we open sourced and uh, you can obtain from this link. Uh, and it's just another D3-based visualization that allows you to run Gremlin queries, which are the queries that we used in the example of uh, the movie database, uh, against a Cosmos DB data set. So, Go ahead and try Cosmos DB for free. Uh, this is the graph database uh, part. And yeah, that's, uh, that's how you can use a graph database to model a problem, and that's how you could use it as opposed to a relational database. Thank you. <laughs>